Hi, and welcome to Viewmaster Travels. My name's Dave, and I've been collecting these vintage 3D reels. Each of these reels has seven 3D photos of some place in the world, taken over 70 years ago, and I've been visiting these places to try and see what's there now. We're looking at reel A3632, one of several Viewmasters of the Petrified Forest area. These pictures were taken in the late 40s. I'm going to try and find each of these pictures in the park, tell you how we found them, see what's there now, and learn some history along the way. There's really two regions in Arizona we're looking at. The Painted Desert, which is this area here, and the Petrified Forest, which is a separate area to the south. People have lived in this region for over 8,000 years, but it was mostly abandoned around 600 years ago, and today there are hundreds of archaeological sites in the area. The Painted Desert was known by the Spanish who explored the area looking for the Seven Cities of Gold in 1540, and they're the ones who named it. The railroad came through the area in 1881, and from then on, people liked to explore the forest, and they took away tons of petrified wood. The area became very popular after the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, since samples of petrified wood were on display there for people to see for the first time. There was so much concern about the damage the tourists were doing to the ancient sites that President Roosevelt declared the area the nation's second national monument in 1906 in order to protect it. The first national monument was Devil's Tower. At this point, I had a couple questions. First off, what's the difference between a national monument and a national park? The short answer is that national monuments can be created just by the president's decree using the Antiquities Act of 1906, which is meant to protect objects and structures that have historic or scientific interest, so it's pretty easy to declare something a national monument. National parks are kind of the same, but they have to be created by Congress, so it's a more difficult process, and it's usually reserved for larger places with a longer-term plan for the site's financial support. In either case, only land owned by the federal government can become a national park or monument, which will be important later. And my second question, what is a petrified forest, and why is there one in the Arizona desert? First thing you need for a petrified forest is a forest. Turns out, over 200 million years ago, back when all the continents were one big landmass, Arizona was the west coast and much more south. This area was a tropical jungle full of giant trees, rivers, and dinosaurs. The trees would die, fall down, and get covered in mud, silt, and ash. Minerals in the water would soak into the wood, slowly crystallize, and replace the tree cells with quartz. These stone trees were buried deeper and deeper over millions of years. Then, about 60 million years ago, after the last dinosaurs had died off and the Rocky Mountains were forming, the Colorado Plateau containing Arizona started to rise up as much as 10,000 feet above sea level. This exposed the land to erosion as ancient rivers carved their way through the region, slowly revealing the long hidden stone logs as the hillsides washed away. Today this area is a national park, and it's easy to find as we followed Route 66 west across the country. We pulled off in the morning and headed into the park looking for our first picture titled West from the Painted Desert Museum. This 1946 Route 66 guidebook mentions an inn and a museum two miles north of the route at the Painted Desert. We drove into the park and in a couple of miles found the Painted Desert Inn. Originally, only the Southern Petrified Forest was a protected national monument. The Painted Desert was on the new highway and it had several tourist attractions near it. One was an observation tower, which is mentioned in our Route 66 guidebook. Another was known as the Lion Farm, which was a trading post and zoo. And further into the desert was a building built out of petrified wood known as Stone Tree House. This was built by Herbert David Lohr sometime before 1920 and was run as a lunchroom, bar, and hotel. Lohr sold it to the U.S. government in 1936 as it was in dire need of repair. The Park Service decided to redesign the building and create a museum and restaurant. 
This was the Great Depression, and Roosevelt's New Deal was happening. Government money was available for works projects, but not for new building construction. So the government decided to keep some of the stone walls and rebuild the remaining structure, which gave them access to the funds they needed. The new building was completely different from the original, and only a few petrified wood walls remain. This Pueblo Revival-styled building became the Desert Inn. It opened in 1940, closed for a few years due to the war, and then opened under management of the Fred Harvey Company in 1947. It was the Harvey House until 1963, when a new facility opened at the entrance to the park and the restaurant moved there. From then on, the building has been a museum, ranger station, and historic attraction. We explained our Viewmaster scavenger hunt to the park ranger, and she gave us quite a tour of the building. They've reproduced the Harvey House soda fountain, and you can see the original kitchens. The building also has small apartments for the rangers and perhaps the Harvey girls to stay in. The view from the back is amazing, and it seems to be exactly the same as when the Viewmaster photographer stood here 70 years ago. Although I suppose at the time he didn't realize the small cafe behind him would become such an important part of the park. Erosion leaves logs on pedestals. I'd assumed that everything in the Viewmaster pictures would be exactly the same today as it was then, but we learned that this desert landscape is changing quite rapidly. In fact, we had a hard time finding any of these log pedestals at all. Seems nearly all of them have collapsed due to erosion, and we saw only a few. And that's not all that's gone. There are several famous views of the petrified forest, many of which you can still see. But here's one that's long gone. This was called Eagle's Beak and was a very popular photo spot for early tourists. It fell down in 1940, so our Viewmaster photographer just missed his opportunity to see it. And this famous log pedestal, which could have been the one we were looking for, fell down and shattered in 2005. But we did see plenty of petrified wood. There are several individual forests of it in the park, and the park road winds through all of them. Blue Mesa. The Blue Mesa Trail is marked on the maps, so we pulled over here and started hiking. The trail dips down into an amazing alien landscape as you follow the pathway. This was my favorite part of the park. The blue hills and petrified wood fragments are really unique. We kept walking and finally came across this distinctive striped hill, and we realized we were standing in the same spot the Viewmaster picture was taken from. You can even see the same trail we were following in the old picture. This area was originally known as the Blue Forest, and these trails were put in by the Civilian Conservation Corps between 1934 and 37, the same time they were rebuilding the Desert Inn. In the 1800s, the Petrified Forest was quite difficult to reach. It was an 18-mile carriage ride from Holbrook, the nearest town, and was impossible to see in a day. Just before the site was declared a national monument, a train station was created near the park in 1896, named Adamana, allowing tourists to visit easily. Some of the original tourist trails were forged by Al Stevenson and James Donahue in the early 1900s. Stevenson owned the hotel in Adamana, and Donahue would give horse and wagon tours through the park. They'd pack a picnic lunch and head into the park, a trip that would take a couple hours. They'd eat their lunch at the natural bridge and continue on to the second forest. The more adventurous would continue down to Jim Camp, a cattle ranch named because the three cowboys who worked there were all named Jim, and they'd camp overnight. After Route 66 brought cars to the area, tourism increased greatly, and it's at this point the Stone Tree House Hotel was built, as well as the Lion Farm and Painted Desert Tower, all along Route 66. The original Northern Loop Road was created so that the hotel's customers could see the painted desert easily. 
And our next stop was the famous picnic site from those original wagon tours. Agate Bridge, petrified log, spans 40-foot ravine. This was easy to find since it's one of the most popular stops in the park. It's clearly marked on the map. This site's pretty much unchanged. The petrified span had supports added way back in 1911, which you can see in shadow in the Viewmaster picture. Pictures and descriptions of sites like this drew more and more tourists to the park. The Park Service decided to expand the boundaries of the park to protect more and more of the area, adding thousands more acres over the years. They purchased the Stone Tree House and the Loop Road area north of it and expanded the park by doing so. And after the war, park officials started a plan to upgrade from National Monument to National Park. But remember that in order to be a national park, all the land must be owned by the federal government. There were still a few ugly tourist traps along Route 66, the main one being the lion farm right here on the edge of the desert and right in the middle of the proposed National Park expansion. Luckily for the park, plans were afoot to upgrade Route 66, which had fallen into some disrepair, and park officials realized that if Route 66 could be rerouted instead of repaired, that traffic would bypass the lion farm, starving it of business and forcing it to close. Route 66 was rerouted from here to here in 1960, although it's not clear how much influence the park actually had over this, but the lion farm and other attractions along this stretch quickly failed as cars drove right by them. The lion farm itself was burned to the ground, so nothing remains, but some artifacts of the painted desert trading post to the east remain. Now the land was cheap to purchase, and the Park Service quickly did so, and the area became a national park soon after in 1962. More on Route 66 in a moment, but for now, here's our next goal. Old Faithful, the largest log yet found. This one's another very famous attraction in the park. It's at the south end of the park in the Giant Logs Forest, and it's a marked spot on the trail. This log is 35 feet long and weighs 44 tons, and was named Old Faithful in the 20s by the then superintendent's wife, Dama Smith, who thought the log was as important to the park as Old Faithful was to Yellowstone. Interestingly, if you look carefully, there's now a concrete support under the end of the log that wasn't there when the Viewmaster picture was taken. Turns out the log was struck by lightning in 1962 and fractured. The park decided to build a support for the log to keep it from collapsing. This area has the largest logs in the park, and we spent some time wandering around them. But back to Route 66. Since it was rerouted a couple miles to the south, that meant the original road was within National Park property and had to be preserved. So this is the only stretch of original Route 66 protected within a national park. You pass the remnants of the road as you enter the park, if you look carefully, and as you head south to the petrified forest, you come across a well-marked turnoff where you can still see the old telephone poles that ran along the road, and maybe you can find old garbage that was thrown from a car window. I think it's pretty neat that this stretch has remained protected and untouched for over 60 years. Newspaper Rock, Indian Petroglyphs Recording Ancient Events This area was very easy to find. There's a pull-off for it, easy parking, and it's just at the edge of the parking lot. Looks like the Viewmaster photographer was able to wander down around the petroglyphs, though. But now you can't, so finding these specific drawings from a distance took some searching. 
Some of these markings are over 2,000 years old. They're tapped out of the black varnish that accumulates on many of the desert rocks. From a distance, you can't really see them, so the park put in telescopes to get a closer view. Turns out there did used to be a trail down to the rocks that the Viewmaster photographer must have used, but the slow erosion of the cliffs caused giant slabs of granite to collapse, obliterating the trail in 1984. And not far from these petroglyphs is one of the largest native pueblos in the park, Puerco Pueblo, originally known as Atamana Ruin, since it used to be a tour stop from the Atamana Hotel. This is the remains of a hundred-room Pueblo structure that would have surrounded an open plaza where people lived in the 12th and 14th centuries, and it's one of the most important archaeological sites in the area. There's also hundreds of petroglyphs in this area, including a really cool spiral glyph that represents the sun. A crack in the next boulder casts a beam onto the spiral, exactly at dawn during the summer equinox. This site is one of the biggest archaeological sites in the area, but it's nowhere near the only one. Agate House, 800 years old, Third Forest. This location turned out to be a problem. It's clearly marked on the map, but as it turns out, the house is a two-mile hike away from the road. By the time we'd reached the southern end of the park, we didn't have time to walk to the house and back, so we couldn't visit it. This did surprise me, though. Our Viewmaster photographer didn't strike me as the kind of person to hike two miles to get a picture. The house is on the site of another ancient Pueblo, dating from between 1050 and 1300. However, the structure that's there now is a restoration. And next time we're taking a trip on Route 66, maybe we'll have time to see it. We did manage to solve the mystery of the Lazy View Master photographer, though. Looking through the old maps, most of the two-mile trail to the Agate House used to be a road, the Long Logs Turnout. And Highway 180, now outside the south border of the park, used to run right past the Agate House site. The Long Logs Road must have been closed after 1955, and Highway 180 was moved south after 1970. Either way, I think our Viewmaster photographer just drove to the house and didn't take that long hike. And that's the last picture we're looking for. In writing this episode, I read through extensive research about both the ancient people from thousands of years ago, as well as the changes to Route 66 made just 60 years ago. And in both cases, both the ancient and the recent, a lot of what we used to know has been lost. It's surprising how quickly history gets lost to time. Today, the remains of the lion farm are just as hard to find as Pueblo artifacts. The old eagle's beak is completely gone, and only the last few log pedestals remain. From the name Petrified Forest, I assumed things were frozen in time forever, but it turns out that these sites are changing fast. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.